Amen. Amen. I knew it was going to be a weird morning. So, uh, yeah, the lights, sorry about that. We just, I just turned them off because uh, I don't know if that was distracting for you, but that was also distracting for me. And now, I literally can't see anything. So, I, I don't know if that makes it better or worse. Like, what's that? I, I, I hear you. I don't know. Oh, great. That's great. Yeah, you guys, if you, if you got up and walked out, no hard feelings because I'll never know. I, I might see you once you get to the doors, but... Uh, yeah, hey, it's good. Obviously, this morning isn't uh, as we originally planned. Uh, it was funny. Yesterday morning, I was uh, working in my shop at home, and one of our baptismal candidates texted me saying, hey, um, my mom got COVID, and uh, I was wondering if I could just push it back to the next time we do a baptismal service. I really wanted her to be there. And I'm like, yeah, of course. So there's no problem with that. I texted Scott saying, hey, yeah, so this is what's up. And then like 20 minutes later, Scott calls me and he's like, hey, so uh, I guess who else has COVID? And I'm like, well, I hope not you, but uh, it was him. Uh, and then so we're like, okay, what do we do? Do we do baptisms? It's like, no, let's push them back. There's going to be a baby dedication and everything this morning. Um, and then here we are. Again, I, I considered for probably longer than I should have just bringing swim trunks this morning and, and jumping in the pool. Um, my wife talked me out of it. Actually, she wanted us to move the hot tub to the parents' room so that her and the, and the kids could be in there. And I, I just said, that's, that's too much work. Uh, that's a lot of water, and I'm not that strong. Um, so yeah, we're changing plans, but we're going we're gonna to roll with it, and I'm excited. Um, usually the youth pastor or the kids pastor or whoever's on staff that's not the lead pastor gets um, a couple Sundays a year. Usually it's like uh, the Sunday after Christmas um, or the sum- Sunday that's the first holidays of, of the summer or, or a long weekend or something else like that. Um, but we can officially add uh, the, oh, hey, I just tested positive for COVID the day before. And we can add that one to the list. Also happens to be the Sunday after Easter. So uh, he picked it. I mean, at least he wasn't uh, sick last year. But, but hey, Usually, um, we get a little more notice than this, so forgive me, have some patience with me this morning. I was, uh, I was working on a sermon yesterday, um, and if you, are, uh, if you come to Thrive, if you're, if you're a grade 6 to 12 student or you are a leader, I apologize in advance, because when I get short notice like this, which I've never actually had to do before, I just took the latest series we did at Thrive and mashed it all together into one message. So uh, you've probably heard it once or twice before. Um, the funny thing is, this series that we just did at Thrive, it's called Heart Check, and it's the only series that I've ever done twice at Thrive. I actually wrote it like five years ago-ish, somewhere around there. I've never repeated a series at Thrive until this one. Uh, I felt like it was just really fitting, um, but yeah, it's kind of crazy. Oh. Like, it's been almost seven years this summer that I've been here. I'm like, okay, we can start reusing some sermon series, right? Like, like some of the students will be out of the program soon. And so this was the first series that, or we'll be out of the program that we're in it then. And so the first series that we've ever repeated. And it's something that I think, like, has been on my heart for years. And I think it's very fitting for this morning. And I think it's, um, I think it's going to be okay. So, yeah, if you are a student or you are a youth leader and you've heard me preach this, once, maybe twice. If you're a youth leader now and you were a student then, this will be the third time through for you. So um, you can come preach it if you'd rather, or you can just like um, put some headphones in and check out Calvary Temple or Oasis or something on your phone. And I'm sure they're, I'm sure they're doing good stuff. Um, I won't be offended. I, and I can't see you anyways, so it doesn't matter. Uh, but it starts like this. A few years ago, we were at this um, retreat uh, district, our, our PAOC district does these pastors retreats every once in a while. We haven't done them for a little while, but we were at this retreat, and, and um, the speaker that was there that week started out one of his sessions by asking this simple question that has just rung through my head and my heart for basically since then. And it was that it was basically he basically shared the story saying that every time he went for coffee with this one particular mentor in his life, um, he would start the conversation. The, the mentor would ask him, how is your heart? How is your heart? And, and he shared that they, this would come up uh, so frequently. And honestly, I don't remember anything else that the guy spoke on that entire weekend. And, and like you, you probably, you, we, we don't really remember sermons that well, right? Like at least not for a long time. There's a few things that maybe stick out, um, but, but sometimes it's usually just one point or one thing. And, and that, was, that was for me in that moment. How is your heart? This question that 
was so much deeper than asking like, hey, how's it going? Or, or hey, how was your week? Or hey, how are you doing? It, uh, those questions always just, they seem to fall a bit flat, right? They're a little bit, not meaningless, but less meaningful, right? And they're often followed up by the answer, oh, busy, right? <laughs> like, it's such a cliche, it's such a cop-out answer. Although it might be true, uh, th- there are times when we are super busy and we have a very full schedule and that affects how we are as a person or how we're doing that particular week, right? Like, it, it, it's not necessarily a bad thing to say that. I, I get caught up saying that all the time. But it's still just like those questions are such a surface level question, So, uh, which is okay sometimes. I think it'd be really hard if every time you saw somebody, you weren't allowed to ask those questions and you had to ask like a super deep question. Like that'd get pretty overwhelming if everybody's just pouring each other's hearts out to each other every single time you saw someone. Um, so I'm not, I'm not saying that we, that's not, we should change how we're doing things, but I love that question so much. How is your heart? And, and I think it's something that's kind of wrestled in, in, in me for a long time. Um, and I, I think that in scripture, we see people actually um, wrestling with this as well. I, th- I think r- the reality is this. Some of us are pretty good at, at making the outside look pretty perfect, right? We can put ourselves together. We can put on our show. But this morning, I want to go just a little bit deeper, and I would love for you to reflect on that question. How is your heart? How is my heart? We know that I- if we're talking physically, um, the heart is one of the most important organs in the body, maybe the most important. I don't know. I'm not a medical person. We've got more nurses than a doctor here this morning. I think you can ask them if you want to know if if it's the most important. But I feel like if it's not working well, uh, your body's not going to work very well. Um, But I also feel like if your lungs aren't working well, then your body's probably... So I I don't know what the priority list is. Uh, It doesn't really matter. But we know that it is important. And we know that uh, if we were to get some clogs in our arteries in our heart, or if we were to do something, or something was to stop working, that life would not be as good as it could be, or it could potentially be over, right? Like, like they're, they're, our heart is such an important organ, and I think the same thing goes for us on a spiritual level. There are things that can clog our heart. There are things that can cause damage. There are things that can, can weigh us down. And I love, in the book of Psalms, we all know who David is, probably, if you've read the Bible, if you've been to church. He wrote a lot of the Psalms. Um, and in Psalm 51.10, you'll probably know this verse. This is kind of the theme verse for the whole series. Um, it, it's this really powerful prayer of, of David's at a really dark point in his life. And sorry, I won't have any scripture on the screen this morning. I just did this yesterday. Um, so you have to actually use um, a Bible, I don't know if you know what that is or if you, uh, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, or, or a phone, you know, like I think a Bible app. Like who, do, who does anybody bring a Bible to church, to church on a Sunday morning? I'm so curious. How many Bibles are, oh yeah, Jim Logan, I love it. Couple over here maybe. Yeah, like it's, I mean, who needs it? You got your phone, right? Like I, you read your Bible at, at home or something or you just read your phone all the time. doesn't matter. All that to say, there's not gonna be any scripture on the screen this morning. If you want to trust me, you can. I'll read from the Bible. If you don't want to trust me, you can, you can follow along. Or even if you do trust me, you can also follow along. Um, but in Psalm 51.10, there's this prayer of David right after a really dark point in his life. And it's simple, and you've probably heard it, and it says this, Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. I'm convinced that this is one of the most powerful prayers that we can pray. See, David's heart at the time had been so full of of, of lust for Bathsheba. He had murderous plans for Uriah. There was all sorts of rebellion against God in his heart, in his life. And he desired to basically, for a new heart, God, create in me a pure heart. Create in me a pure heart. Sin had brought his, his heart to this place where it was just abounding with guilt and grief and remorse. And he wanted um, spiritual, basically spiritual heart surgery that only God could really could perform. And, and I believe that this prayer in our lives today can be one of the most powerful things that we can pray. But it also doesn't just happen in a flash, right? When I say God creating me a pure heart, it's not like boom, 
done life change over. I mean, sure, maybe that could happen. I'm not putting it outside of the realm of possibilities with God. But often, I think, it probably requires a little bit of work, right? It's, a, it's, it's an attitude that we have to shift our mindset to, to having this pure heart and to reflecting on, on some of those things that maybe are clogging our hearts. It takes time. It takes work. Um, and, and I think there's a long list of things that could potentially be that quote-unquote heart clog in our spiritual lives. There's a lot of things that it could be, and maybe some of them uh, resonate with you. Maybe some, some of them don't. Um, I don't have an exhaustive list. For this series, we basically spent four weeks going through four different things um, that could be these heart clogs. And, and this morning, we're going to touch on three of them um, for the sake of time. Um, three different things that could potentially be that heart clog. When, when I really have been reflecting on this question, how is my heart... Um, these are some things that kind of popped up that maybe are getting in, in the way of me living life to the fullest, living with a healthy heart. And the first one is this, and I think it's really important. It's anger. First thing that I think can clog our hearts is anger. Anger is such a natural emotion, right? It's such a, it's such a response that just comes so naturally. He, like it, it, if there's something or someone has done wrong to you, it's, it's natural to feel anger towards them, right? It's natural to, to let that kind of just something happen. And I think in Scripture we see um, a lot of anger, actually. You know, there's a, if you look through the Old Testament, you're going to find some anger. Um, but you also see Scripture in Scripture, even in, in the life of Jesus, there's a few times where Jesus, it's hard to define whether or not he was angry. I feel like you kind of would have had to have been there to see what his actual emotion, emotional response was. But there's a few times where Jesus is kind of a little bit outraged, at least. He's a little bit, he's a little bit angry. And, and a lot of scholars will, will argue, or not argue, will say that like, it, we find this story in Matthew chapter 21 where we see Jesus kind of reached the pinnacle of his anger, at least what we see in, in Scripture. I mean, it's hard to maybe, it's hard to maybe make, make a list of how angry Jesus was, but in Matthew chapter 21, verse 12, it, it reads this, Jesus entered the temple courts, and he drove out all who were buying and selling, and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. It is written, he said to them, my house will be called a house of prayer, and you are making it a den of robbers. The blind and the lame came to him at the temple, and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the teachers of the law saw the wonderful things that he did, the children stopping in the temple, or sorry, the children shouting in the temple courts, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. Did you hear what these children are saying, they asked him? Yes, Jesus replied. Have you never read from the lips of children and infants, Lord? Have you, sorry, from the in, lips of children and infants, Lord, you have called forth praise. And he left them, and he went out of the city to Bethany where he spent the night. This is kind of like a double dose of Jesus getting a little bit angry here in Scripture. This is kind of like two instances in one short passage that, where Jesus gets a little upset. And the first one was this injustice that was taking place in the temple. There was people that were making this house of prayer, what was supposed to be a house of prayer, into a den of robbers. And that wasn't okay with Jesus. And Jesus also wasn't okay with these religious leaders getting upset with these children, right? He, He's, he defends both instances. And I don't know, it's hard to see, again, like I said, it's hard to know how angry Jesus physically was in that moment. It's hard to know what his emotional response was. I kind of picture, I mean, if you're, if you're turning tables and, you're, and you're, I think you're probably a little bit upset, right? Like, I think there's at least some emotion overflowing there. But the thing is, the thing is, he was upset with injustice, he was upset with things that, that weren't right, right? This, this place of worship was never meant to be this, this place where people were taking advantage of people. He was upset with that. He was upset with the misuse of, or the mistreatment of these children. And so I think there's an okay place for, for, for us even today for anger to exist. There are some things that should make us angry, Right? Injustices in this world should be something that fires up, fires us up. When humans are not treated well, it should cause us to want to do something about it. 
Any act of terror or, or any war, it, 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 it should make us a little bit angry. However, I think that sometimes anger can become a major heart issue. It's a natural response, but it's also an emotion that causes us to take action. Sometimes to lesser degrees than others, and sometimes because of smaller infractions against us than others, but it causes us to take action. That action might be as simple as bottling it up inside. That action might be to, to overreact in a situation that you might not otherwise have. To say something that, that maybe we might have regretted. To just shut people out. To do all of these things. See, Jesus, when he was angry, at least in this couple instances that we, we see, it causes him to make the world a better place around him. And these injustices cause him to, to make some sort of correction. And how often do we do that? How often do we turn the anger, regardless of what it's from, maybe we're angry at a friend, maybe we're angry at a pastor, I don't know, probably been mad at me before, uh, but I know my wife probably has. Maybe we're angry at a spouse, maybe we're angry at a child, our children, maybe we're angry at whatever reason or whatever thing is, how, how often, how often do we let that just consume us or, or how often do we let it be something that causes us to make the situation better? See, here's the reality with anger and this is why I think it's a heart issue. Is because anger often leads to bitterness. And I really think that bitterness is a heart issue. I'm convinced of, and, and, and I, I said this to our students multiple times throughout the series, and I'm convinced of this, that that, that stuff that we're holding onto, that bitterness that we're holding into our heart, and maybe this isn't everybody, but for some of us, it, it is something that we do often. That stuff that we're holding onto is actually holding us down. That anger and bitterness that we bundle up is, is actually slowing us down from becoming the person we're meant to be. And get this, this is the important part. It's ruining relationships along the way. That anger and that bitterness, I think one of the trends that you're going to notice with a lot of these heart issues is that they're both slowing you down from becoming who we're meant to be. But it's also re ruining relationships along the way. And I'm just about as guilty of this as the next guy. I sometimes have a little bit of a temper. I try to control it, but, like, it, it's hard sometimes. I get it. Um, I, I can let things get deeper than they should, but I think we should be cautious of that situation. And I think as we reflect on that question, how is my heart, we should be honest with what are we angry about, what are we bitter about, what are we holding up. The next issue that we talked about a week later, um, and I think is another major issue, um, is pride. And pride is, is a, kind of a weird one. Like some of us exhibit pride, I think, in different ways. It's probably something that we've all had at some point. And just, to, just like anger, it's in and of itself, it isn't a bad thing, I don't think. It's okay to be proud. It's okay, it's okay to feel positive about yourself. It's okay for a little bit of pride to exist, but it's a problem when it gets in the way. It's a problem when it starts to take control of our lives and maybe starts to clog an artery, if you will, um, in our heart. Because what happens sometimes is that we get so full of ourselves that we forget about everyone else around us. And I love what Paul says to the church in Galatia, in, in Galatians six chapter or uh, yeah sorry six, chapter six verse one to five he says he says carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. If anyone thinks they are something when they are not, they deceive themselves. Each one should test their own actions, then they can take pride in themselves alone without comparing themselves to anyone else. For each one should carry their own load. If anyone thinks they're something when they're not, they deceive themselves. I think one of the things that Jesus exemplified most on earth was humility. I mean, the very fact that Jesus was on earth was an act of humility. We read in Philippians 2 that it's God basically surrendering the divine attributes, becoming human, humbling himself to death, even death on a cross. The very definition of Jesus walking earth is an act of humility. We get that beautiful picture. I love what C.S. Lewis wrote in maybe his 
most famous book, I mean, at least just most famous non-book, non-fiction book. Um, it's not a non-book. Uh, Mere Christianity. And he writes this, a proud man is always looking down on things and people. And of course, as long as you are looking down, you cannot see anything that's above you. So I think that as followers of Jesus, we need to, we need to be very careful of, of, of not letting our pride be the thing that gets in the way of somebody else experiencing Jesus through us. It can clog our heart, and it can get in the way so easily. When we begin to think that, that we're better than other people, when we begin to think of ourselves higher than others, we aren't really living with, with a gospel mindset. We're not really living with the mind of Jesus and living through the eyes of how God views people. We're called to walk in humility. So we've got anger, we've got pride, and the third one we're going to talk about briefly today is fear. And again, there's a long list of things that could potentially be um, holding down our hearts or clogging our hearts um, but the third thing we're going to look at briefly is fear. Fear, um, I think, again, can be one of the most natural emotions that, that we face on a daily basis. But it's also one that I think gets in the way so often. It gets in the way. I love um, what John writes, in, in the, in, not in his, his gospel, but in First in John, which we're actually going through right now at Thrive. We just started a new series on Friday going through the book of First John. But in First John chapter 4, Verse 16, he says this, and, and so we know and rely on the love that God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. And this is how love is made complete among us so that we, have, so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. In this world, we are like Jesus. Get this part. There's no fear in love. But perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. I love that line that fear has to do with punishment. There's no, perfect love drives out fear because there, it, the, fear has to do with punishment. If, if I'm afraid of something, it's not often because of that physical thing. It's because of what that physical thing could do to me. Right? How many of you are afraid of snakes? Anybody? Nobody? Well, a couple people. Okay. Pretend I told you that there's a bunch of snakes in this pool. That would probably make some of us uncomfortable, right? Like, we'd be like maybe itching a little bit. Like, what? I'm, I'm out of here, right? Also, you might be in a Southern Baptist church, but that's a different story. Um, but pretend that this is filled with a bunch of snakes. It, 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 that can be terrifying for some people. Right? That's like that's, there's people that are just like, oh, I'm thinking about it. But if I told you that there's physically no possible way for those snakes to ever get out of that pool ever, one, it would suck for the baptismal candidates next week. But two, we have no reason to be afraid of it, right? Because, because the thing itself can't do anything to us, right? Sure, we could be afraid of it, but often our fears, and, and snakes are just a, an example. It could be anything. Often our fears are, are only fears because we're afraid of what they could do to us, right? We're afraid of, of, of that unpleasant thing that could happen to us. The dictionary definition of fear is an unpleasant emotion caused by, by the belief that someone or something is dangerous, likely to cause pain or a threat. We're scared. We walk in fear because we think that something negative is going to happen. I used to fear the wooden spoon like nobody's business, right? You know what I'm talking about. Some grandmas know what I'm talking about anyways. My grandma, anytime we went over there and my sister and I were, you know, being sisters and brothers, not sisters, plural, brothers and sisters, I don't know how you say it, it doesn't matter. Anytime we were getting at each other's throat a little bit, the wooden throat, the throat, oh goodness gracious, the wooden spoon threat would come out. And the thing is, I wasn't actually scared of the physical spoon itself, you know, like, like it's not scary when you go to stir a pot of craft dinner. It's scary what it could do to you when, you're, when it's being threatened, right? We're scared of the potential of the, what things could do to us, not necessarily the thing itself. But I ask myself this question for when we're talking about spiritual fears or fears that we have in life or deep anxieties or things like that. 
What, is, what does it mean that perfect love casts out all fear? As we begin to become more like Jesus, we, we can step out of some of those fears because we recognize that there's, there's no punishment in perfect love. But like anger, what we do with our fears, I think actually might determine who we are becoming. So as we let go of that, that fear and as we step out in faith, uh, we, can, we can brace ourselves for the greatest adventure uh, of our life. There's no fear in love, but perfect love casts out all fear. I love what John says, not in First John, but actually in his gospel, in John 14, 27, he just says, and this is the words of Jesus, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. I do not give as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. We ought to be cautious of fear clogging our heart. The other heart clogger that we talked about, and I don't know why I'm calling them heart cloggers right now. I didn't actually refer to it as that at any point throughout the series, neither times that I preached it. But the other thing is, that we talked about is self-esteem, and, and we'll, we'll touch that, we'll leave that for now, because uh, I'll get you guys out of here shortly. Um, but I would challenge you this morning, I would challenge you this morning to, to ask yourself that question, how is my heart today? What are the things in my heart, when I pray the prayer, create in me a pure heart, what are the things in my heart that actually need to be purified? right? Like, we pray that prayer. Like, we, we might pray it, but like, it, it means nothing if, if we aren't reflecting on the things that, okay, God, what are the things that you can work on in my heart? What are the things that I can work on with you in my heart? What are the things that can make me a better person today? What are the things that can make me a little bit more like Jesus today? What, where, where are my downfalls? Where are my, where, what are the things that are getting in the way? And for you, maybe it's anger. Maybe it's fear. Um, maybe it's the other thing that I mentioned, pride. Um, or maybe it's something else. But I think this prayer is one of the most profound things that we can pray. And I think it's something that, that just, it, it's such a deeper level to, to the conversation than how are you doing or how is it going. God, create in me a pure heart and renew in me a steadfast spirit. So that's my prayer for you this morning, is that, that, that you would partner with God in that process of creating a pure heart in you so that tomorrow we might look a little bit more like Jesus. I believe that that's what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. I believe that that's the journey that we're all on, is every day looking a little bit more like Jesus. So let me pray this morning for you, and then we'll get you out of here. God, thank you that you care so much about us, Lord, that you see our hearts. That, God, you see them through the lens of a father, God, through the, through the eyes of your son, God, you see our hearts and you see us just as we are today. There's no hiding, there's no shame, there's, no, there's, nothing, that, there's nothing that we can just put on the back burner that you can't see. God, and thank you that you care for us. Thank you that you care for every single person in this room more than they could possibly even imagine. And that you want to see us live the best life that we could live. So God, I pray for every single person in this room that we will wake up and, and pray that prayer, maybe even tomorrow. God, create in me a pure heart today. What are the things that I need to work on today? What are the things that, that you need to point out to me today? And God, may we walk each day, each day trying to become a little bit more like you, Jesus so that we might see lives changed in our world, not for our glory, but for your glory, so that we might see people restore, God, broken relationships restored, God, broken homes restored, so that we might see essentially revival in, in, in the world around us, God. That we get to be a part of that. We get to be a part of your story each and every day, so may we wake up, and try to become a little bit more like you, Jesus. Thank you, God, for today. Thank you that we get to do this today, um, that we get to be here, even in the midst of whatever season we're in outside right now. God, we're, we're grateful. So 
um, be with us as we go our ways. And yeah, just let us have an amazing day in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So yeah, we're having water baptisms next week. We'll get some people dunked. Uh, we're super excited for that. Um, the only other announcement that I'm aware of is that our 55 plus group is heading to the Qualico restaurant on in Assiniboine Park, Park this Friday. So if you have any questions about that or are interested in signing up for that, talk to Wilma or Judy. I don't know if I saw them this morning. The roads were kind of crazy. Um, so if you don't find them this morning, and I can't see anybody, so I don't know if they're here. Um, if you don't find them this morning, email Tia or like office at Grace Winnipeg, and she'll uh, send you in the right direction. Uh, that's April 29th at 1130. Um, other than that, yeah, that's great. I don't have a benediction for you. My benediction's always kind of been what? Get out of here. Have a good morning, everyone.